Um, welcome to the August 2023rd Hyperledger Mortgage Financial Market Subgroup Meeting. That, that's always a mouthful first thing in the morning. <laughs> uh, before we get started, I'd like to express our appreciation to the Financial Markets uh, Special Industry Group and the Hyperledger Foundation for making uh, this meeting possible and their ongoing support. Uh, as you can see, the topic for this meeting is not one blockchain to rule them all, interoperability across blockchains. Okay, as always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and we are under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy, which we're sharing on the screen now, and the code of conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussions of company-specific pricing, products, and projects. We don't make negative comments about other companies or products. And the code of conduct means that we treat each other with respect, never discriminate and communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity and inclusion. And for new participants, we welcome you. And if you'd like to please introduce yourself on the chat and let us know if there's anything interesting or anything uh, of specific interest to you. Okay. Here's our agenda for today. Uh, James Hendrick will provide an update on developments in the mortgage industry. For the past three months, we've been delving into blockchain and AI. This month, we're going to take a break from that topic and talk about interoperability across blockchains. The reason for this shift is as follows. We've been discussing AI and blockchain and a lot of the solutions that we've been discussing aren't necessarily on Hyperledger Fabric. Although we do lean towards fabric, we don't think this diversity of blockchains is a bad thing. Um, each blockchain has its own strengths and uses. However, one thing we do wanna stress is interoperability across blockchains. The proliferation of different and potentially siloed blockchains can serve as an impediment to the growth of blockchain usage. So today we'd like to underscore the importance of interoperability across blockchain. We always cover this slide in the beginning of each meeting, and, and this is to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain journey, but we may be at different points along that path. So for today's topic of interoperability, we're all going back to the beginning of our blockchain journey and do some education. Okay, before we go into our presentation, we do wanna make a public service announcement. Hyperledger has rebranded with a new logo, color scheme, et cetera. Next month, we'll have a new presentation format, but we thought we'd give everyone a sneak peek as to what that new um, branding looks like. So you can see on the left, that's the old one. On the right is a new one, new color schema. I really like the new logo. And we're gonna have another slide towards the end of this presentation that does have that new format. I think it looks pretty cool. Okay, the next three slides I always mention are for those that are new to the group and would like more information. This slide links to different resources for the Linux Foundation, Hyperledger Foundation. As you can see for a second from the bottom is the link to our mortgage subgroup wiki. Um, it contains the meeting notes for our groups, recordings from previous sessions, and curated articles about blockchain in the mortgage industry. These are great resources, and I highly encourage you to use them. In order to access those resources, you will need an LFID, and this slide shows you how to do how to access that. I'm not going to go over it, but just sharing so that uh, you guys know how to access that information. Uh, another thing that we always like to share is this is tr free training that Hyperledger offers. Uh, as I always mentioned, I've taken this training. It's fantastic. So I highly encourage you to use it. Okay, next, James Hendrick will walk us through the state of blockchain in the global mortgage industry. Take it away, James. Marvin, thank you very much. Great introduction and uh, looking forward to the new branding as well from Hyperledger. Let's go ahead and jump into the first slide, Marvin. So a couple of articles to talk about today. So XRP Ledger, our first one, has welcomed the first stablecoin backed by mortgages. The innovative stablecoin, dubbed Home, is set to redefine the landscape of mortgage financing and offer homeowners better and more accessible options. 
Developed by the RWA protocol, the XRP community can benefit from the stability and growth potential of mortgages, which offer a steady stream of reliable income. So far, the RWA protocol has facilitated the funding of over 46 home loans, which has helped showcase the effectiveness of the new innovation. Some key benefits to uh, the home stable coin include transparency on the loans backed by the coin. So all over collateralized loans backing the coin may be viewed on the blockchain. Currently, the return on this product ranges around two to five percent. And loans are backed by homes with more than that amount. The average loan is being over collateralized by 30 percent or more. And lastly, assets and the creation of loans are decentralized, so distributed around the U.S., and they're open to any loan officer or financial institution to originate. So highly recommend taking a look at the article because it is the newest stable coin that's out on the market. The next article that we have is relative to smart contracts and getting a home loan. It, you know, this is a great article. It starts out with defining what the difference is between a smart contract and a traditional contract. So if you're not familiar with those differences, great article to, to jump into and uh, learn about. He, you know, discusses what are the difference of the parties involved? What are the roles of lawyers, bank representatives, and signature witnesses in a paper contract compared to a smart contract? What's the validity of the contract? They had a great quote in there of, why should the world trust the crazy moon math that is blockchain? It's really because there are these are peer-reviewed mathematical proofs that guarantee that certain axioms will always hold true if used properly. It goes over what are the difference between the terms and conditions of both traditional versus smart contract, as well as the enforcement of court. Traditional versus smart scenario, enforcement is done automatically through the code itself. Terms and conditions are self-executing, and there's no need for intermediators, intermediators intermediaries or third parties to enforce. So while the automatic execution of smart contracts provides efficiency and eliminates the need for legal proceedings, it also means that there's no room for subjective interpretation or negotiation. So again, another great article if you want to learn the difference between a smart contract and a traditional paper contract. Next slide, Marvin. So, you know, as Marvin mentioned at the beginning, we just came off of a series of doing blockchain and AI and some of the tie-ins. There are a couple of little things that I still wanted to introduce to this group at the tail end of that series. This first article actually is more blockchain focused than AI focused, but it's a LinkedIn article by Kamlesh Naguari. Um, he is the engineer at Trust for their AI systems and blockchain. And he talks about how blockchain could be the trust layer for artificial intelligence. Blockchain can provide an immutable timestamp record of who created what and when using artificial intelligence. Industry applications and financial services, supply chain, telecommunications, health insurance, they can all benefit from this. And the things they benefit are from the verifiable data of a blockchain, um, enhancing data privacy and security, immutable audit trails, and combating AI bias and manipulation. I think this one's kind of significant. It can record and validate the sources and characteristics on the blockchain so biases can be detected and addressed effectively. The article goes on to talk about how, according to Gardner, the business value provided by blockchain will reach $176 billion by 2025 and projected at $3.1 trillion by 2030. AI will contribute $391 billion in business value by 2025. And then the very last article I wanted to pass along, um, you know, as we know, like any new technology, as AI comes along, it develops a whole new language of terms that we're getting used to. So, you know, we've all heard and potentially explored terms related to AI, such as ChatGPT, OpenAI, and DAL-E. But, you know, are you familiar with large language, large language models? pathways language model and the difference between natural language generation and natural language processing. 
But this is a great article containing over 60 AI specific terms and definitions to get you familiar with the AI universe. So whether you're looking to understand what neuromorphic computing is, it's actually one I'm very fascinated about. It's a computer design that's my, modeled after elements of the human brain, or what a uh, generative adversarial network is. Um, this is a great article into the introduction of AI. And as you can see, there's still plenty of terms that I'm getting myself familiar with as well. Uh, next uh, slide, uh, James. A uh, quick Pardon. question on the AI yeah. needs blockchain. Uh, does it make sense to for us to bring back Kamlesh because he's spoken before our group before, and he was a pretty good speaker, Kamlesh Naguari. You know, I am sure at a future point we're going to be bringing AI back into the discussion, and I think he would be an excellent uh, invite back to this meeting. Okay, cool. And on to the next slide, Marvin. So for all of you that are new, this is the Hyperledger Mortgage Subgroup Wiki. Um, in fact, Alma just dropped a link into the chat if you'd like to click on that link and mark it as a favorite. All of these articles that uh, we covered today, along with plenty more that we've covered over the last two years, are available on the site. We also have a collection of over 200 other articles we've collected over the last two years. So if you guys are looking for information, definitely take a look at this site. That's a large source of information. Also, feel free to reach out to Marvin and I directly. Also, if you're interested in any of those previous presentations on AI and blockchain or any of the blockchain presentations we've done since 2021, over on the left side there, you'll actually see a link to each one of those uh, subgroup meetings. And within those links, you'll find a recording of the presentation along with the presentation decks themselves. And Marvin, next slide. And it's back over to you. Hey, thanks, James. Uh, great information as usual. So um, before we dive into this, uh, not one blockchain to rule them all. So I hope you guys recognize the Lord of the Rings reference there. So I do fully admit I'm a bit of a nerd. Okay, uh, this is actually a quote from Danielle Barbosa, the executive director of the Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, she's saying, she was saying that Hyperledger is not intended to be an overarching blockchain and other blockchains are needed and welcome. And this diversity underscores the need for interoperability. So the Hyperledger, she actually um, made that quote at the Hyperledger Foundation presentation in San Francisco on July 10th. That's the link on the left-hand side. It's the source of our headline quote. It's also one of the reasons we decided to focus on interoperability. So we wanted to give you guys a link to that presentation. Um, it was a really good presentation. They brought a lot of people talking about some of the different blockchains that are out there, uh, about how especially Ethereum is still a very valid blockchain and a key key component uh, for Hyperledger. They went in depth into EVMs, which I think are a very good tool. So definitely take a look at that uh, when you get a chance. And also, especially on the topic of interoperability, the presentation uh, on the right-hand side is, is a, another really good presentation that specifically delves into one of the tools that you can use for interoperability connecting public and private blockchains. Um, so, and if you've been following our previous presentations and the proof of concepts that we've been talking about and actually executed, you'll know that we did use a Hyperledger Firefly in those POCs. And I personally highly recommend it. It's a great tool and aids in the establishment and maintenance of blockchain. So we provided a, a link for that at the bottom as well. So definitely highly encourage the use of Hyperledger Firefly. Okay, um, we talked about the proliferation of blockchains. So let's go through some of the blockchains that are currently being used within the mortgage industry and some of these specific applications. Uh, keep in mind that this list is, is not comprehensive, but it, it's as complete of an inventory as, as I've been able to compile. And it includes both public and private blockchains 
And I did try to exclude uh, those that were used exclusively or primarily for crypto. So uh, the um, one blockchain that James mentioned uh, on Ripple, that one's not on here. That was relatively recent. So if there are people on the call that have used a blockchain application within the mortgage industry, or just general financial services that you want to call out that you think ought to be on this list, by all means, definitely let us know. So with that, let, let's just dive right into it. The very first one, provenance, they are like the 800 pound gorilla in, in the mortgage industry. It's a decentralized public blockchain built on the Cosmos e ecosystem with Cosmos SDKs. The architecture of the blockchain was designed intentionally to meet the specific and unique requirements of the regulated financial services industry, specifically mortgage. Provenance is used by figure for loan origination, equity management, private fund services, banking, and payments. Um, the next item, Redwood Trust and Liquid Mortgage placed uh, all their loans in an SEMT 2020 securitization on a blockchain test environment on Provenance. I, they did a, a fantastic white paper on this where they talked about saving, I believe it was about 100 basis points and securitization costs uh, by using blockchain. And those primarily just uh, eliminating a lot of the uh, multiple audits that the securitization required. The pool consisted of about 338 loans and an approximate principal value of 294 million. This took place in, in December of 2020. Another company that uses provenance, and, and again, another major player within Mortgage is Sagen. Uh, they're a fintech software mortgage uh, and servicing company. They service a lot of the top banks and lenders within the US. They partnered with Figure to accelerate Figure's uh, transformative blockchain usage. So those three companies, Figure, Redwood Trust, Sagen, big proponents of Provenance. Provenance is a great blockchain. And one of the things I wanted to mention on here is Provenance did set up a fund. I forgot how much it was. I think it's about 25 or 50 million. If someone in the chat knows where they would give a grant to people that were interested in developing on the Provenance blockchain. I, I think that was a fantastic step that to help propagate the, the use of Provenance. So if you're curious about that, let me know. We can give you the information. Uh, if you're looking for some funds for development, for test development within blockchain and the mortgage industry, and there's that grant from the Provenance Foundation. And uh, Marvin, actually, I just looked it up and I found the grant program for Providence and I dropped a link into chat. Awesome. Thank you, James. Okay. Uh, the other uh, blockchain that is used wide, widely throughout uh, the mortgage industry is Ethereum. If they're in one of the most uh, widely used blockchains in general. So I've listed some of the applications that use blockchain and that use the Ethereum blockchain. And again, by all means, this is not comprehensive, but let me just give you some information on, on the ones that I have listed. Um, Ave, I, they, they really do need to tell people how to pronounce some of these names, but Ave is a decentralized non-custodial liquidity protocol where users can participate as depositors or borrowers. And the depositors provide liquidity to the market and earn passive income while borrowers are able to borrow in an over, over collateralized or under collateralized fashion. So a, a really interesting tool, a, a little um, crypto uh, focus, but I, I think a good tool. Compound, another Ethereum project that focuses on allowing borrowers to take out loans um, and lenders to provide loans by locking their assets into the protocol. MakerDAO, um, this enables the generation of DAI day, I think, the world's, what they call, quote unquote, world's first unbiased currency. Um, and it's built on the Ethereum blockchain and it's a decentralized stable coin. So I think this is along the same lines as what you were talking about, James, as Ripple. And then uh, the next item, DXDY, another one that's built over e Ethereum specifically on smart contracts. And it uses Stark 
zero knowledge uh, roll up offering crypto margin trading. So if you have a really high risk profile, <laughs> and I emphasize really high risk profile, and you want to trade on crypto margin, well, <laughs> there you go. So um, hope you have a lot of cash. Okay, the other item, the last one on this list is Fulcrum. Fulcrum is a DeFi platform that allows users to borrow and lend ETH and ERC-20 tokens. So it's similar to D DYDX. Um, and remember that leveraging that we talked about in DX, DY that I just alluded to? Yes, it, it's kind of like that, but the big difference that Fulcrum stress is when you have value, it's tokenized. Frankly, I'm, I, I don't fully understand um, these two items. I, I really do have to take a look at it. If there are people out there that have actually been using these uh, for margin trading or, or other purposes, um, definitely let us know. Um, I, I think it's a real interesting tool. Um, I, I'm not sure I fit that risk profile right now. I have four kids in college, so okay. <laughs> Hey, um, and, you know, Marvin, to add to Ethereum, I think I also picked up on um, the first video link that you showed for Hyperledger Ethereum and the future of enterprise blockchain. Um, Antoine Tolmy from Spunk talked about Bezu and how Bezu is built on Ethereum. And the reason I bring that up is their first attempt was in developing the Quorum platform, uh, which was in conjunction with JP Morgan. Yeah, that's a, a really good point. And that's one of the reasons that we chose Hyperledger. They have so many of these tools, Bezo being one of them that provides that interoperability with Ethereum. Um, and there are other tools that do provide that linkage with Ethereum as well. So uh, again, I, I, I really do need to give uh, uh, a recommendation for Hyperledger because the, they're not siloed and they're not um, as as focused on Hyperledger, they do try to keep it open source. So I uh, definitely appreciate that perspective. Um, and, and speaking of Hyperledger, last week we had, um, it was, uh, I'm trying to find the name here, um, Sanjay Kumar Nishank, the COO from Intain. That's a tool that we saw last month. They demoed their solution, which is a blockchain enabled platform for structured finance. Um, and, and it's gonna be those types of specialized finance deals that I, I think are really gonna stand out with these items uh, on the right-hand column. So uh, first, SunWest Mortgage. I'll definitely have more to say about SunWest Mortgage later on in the presentation. Um, I put, I created a category called unknown because the items here, I'm not quite sure what blockchain platform they use. Um, I have spoken with Pavan, the CEO of SunWest. They have a fantastic tool set. Um, their blockchain and AI enabled platform, which was called Morgan, was rebranded to be Angel AI. And I saw a demo of it. It's a fantastic tool. If you guys haven't seen it, definitely go out there and take a look at it. I'm not quite sure what blockchain they use. I think they do keep that relatively close to their best, but they have some really interesting technology. One of the things that I want to point about SunWest is their true token. True, which stands for thoroughly approved and underwritten approval, is a token which is based on a conditional guarantee. So if you go through the origination process with SunWest and they approve your loan, you're granted a token, a true token, which you then can apply to um, buying a house. So you can use that in lieu of an offer letter and they say it provides a lot more protection than an offer letter. And if the parameters of that approval change, SunWest says they will stand by that approval. So I'm not quite sure what the, exactly that means, but that's a pretty bold statement. Highly encourage you guys to take a look at that. Okay, uh, Ranieri Solutions. Ranieri is a company that we actually had um, on, uh, on one of our mortgage subgroups several months ago. Back then, they specifically said they're using Hyperledger Fabric. 
I think they may be changing. I don't have all the intelligence on this, so I put them in the unknown column, but they demoed a servicing solution, uh, which was which they were still in the process of building, but it had a lot of strong components. So highly encourage you guys to take a look at that one as well. The, the next two items I, I think are in the same vein as in pain F E. Uh, Hamza is, uh, it, it, it uses tokenization of alternative assets, specifically commercial loans, trade receivables, and inventory. So uh, one to take a look at, Invinium is another tokenization solution, specifically uh, commercial real estate. They say that digital, they call it digital data solutions for private market assets. So the, those are two really good ones. Um, again, I would put them in the same vein as in pain FP, but I'm not quite sure what blockchain they use. So um, those are all the ones that I've identified. Again, this is not comprehensive. I'm sure there are other blockchain solutions out there. I did want to list some of the other blockchains, Bitcoin, Corda, Quorum. There are in hundreds, literally hundreds of other blockchains out there, but uh, those are the biggest ones at least relative to our industry to Morgan. Let me pause there and see if there are any questions or just to give myself a breather before we go on to the next slide. Okay. Um, so one, one of the things that uh, I also wanted to talk about was the advantages of having interoperability and obviously the ability to share data across multiple blockchains that improves transparency and reduces delays. Um, interoperability allows for dApps for decentralized applications that can access multiple blockchains simultaneously. Um, interoperable applications and smart contracts Developers can leverage the strengths of different networks without being limited to a single platform's capabilities. They can also harness or, or leverage a wider range of resources and functionality. Um, interoperability fosters innovation by promoting interoperable applications and smart contracts. Um, another point that uh, I wanted to bring out is increased transaction throughput. I know one of the most consistent criticisms that I hear, and I think we all hear about blockchain is a TPS transaction per second. So interoperability can potentially improve transaction output. And I think that that's something that some people say doesn't make sense. And, and we'll get into that later on in the deck. But these are, are some of the um, advantages of interoperability. Uh, the other, ability to do atomic swaps. So peer-to-peer -peer trading mechanisms used for transferring cryptocurrencies across different blockchains. That's what atomic swaps are. So cross-chain technology interoperability allows atomic swaps. And I know that those are really, really difficult to execute. So the more interoperability you have, the easier it is to accomplish atomic swaps. And then smart chains, which uh, allow you to seamlessly interact with other chains in your ecosystem. So I know I was going through that pretty quickly. There's a, a lot of complexity within all this. And if it's something that you guys are interested in diving down into a lot further, we definitely can. And we can talk about that towards the, the end of this uh, presentation. Okay, how to achieve interoperability. There's a myriad of ways to achieve interoperability, and I've listed some of these down here. Um, I'm not going to go into all of these because there's a lot of technical complexity to each of these. Um, I'm just going to go over a, a couple of them. Uh, side chains, separate blockchains that are linked to, to the main chain. Um, there are several companies out there that uh, allow for that facilitate uh, side chains. I think Chainlink is one of them. There are a couple others. Notary schemes. I mean, I'm 
honestly, I'm not sure if I'm a big believer in, in notary schemes. Those are third parties that manage the lack of trust between the two parties. Um, I'm not sure if this is smart contract driven, automated. I was trying to look for an actual example of a notary scheme uh, or of a notary solution. And I wasn't able to find one. So I'm not sure if this is one of those really ephemeral solutions that uh, people think, hey, let's try and do this, but never actually do it. Um, so that's one. Oracles, uh, these are third parties that provide validation and information for, um, for blockchains. They bridge the information gap between on-chain and off-chain settings. There are quite a few companies that do this. Uh, blockchain routers, uh, I'm not gonna go over uh, a lot of these, but I did want to drop down to industrial solution. In Polkadot is, I think, a a really good solution. It, it's one that's been out there for a while. Polkadot is a what they're calling a layer zero protocol. At the center of the ecosystem is the relay chain, a Polkadot blockchain, and it's surrounded by uh, side chains called parachains in the polka dot ecosystem the, this is used by quite a few different solutions already so it, it's one that's worth talking about um, i already talked about chain link as a potential side chain so those are quite a few of the solutions that are out there um, so i i know that there's some chats going on and i just did want to see if there are any questions about this Actually, you're good, Marvin. Um, people were just inquiring about some of the white paper stuff, so we put some links into the chat for them. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. If you guys have questions or would like some uh, more information, in that that's really the purpose uh, of our meeting is to educate. Okay, um, we talked about the advantages of interoperability. And I want to point out that there are really two distinct camps when it comes to interop interoperability. The first camp believes that interoperability leads to a whole greater than the sum of the parts. That is that the synergies obtained exceed the weaknesses associated with each part. The second believes that the whole is only as strong as its weakest link. And that's really what's underscored within each slide. Um, in, it, in an interoperability model, each blockchain ledger has a different trust model and you're transferring information from one ledger to another so that the less reliable ledger uh, send the information to the more reliable ledger can leave the more reliable ledger open to manipulation. So if you're connecting to, and I'm trying to simplify it, if you're connecting to a blockchain that's weak, you will assume the weakness of that blockchain. And this is one of the biggest concerns within information security circles. When you let another party into your environment and they're not as secure as you are, you are open to that uh, security weakness. So that, that's really what that first bullet is meant to convey. And I'm sure all the information security people are, are nodding their heads saying, yep, uh, that, that's exactly the risk here. And, and I wanted to call out that in 2022, there was a security breach um, in the Rona network that was essentially uh, um, an occurrence uh, of what we just talked about. Ronin was a sidechain developed for uh, the popular game Axie Infinity. Hackers exploited a vulnerability in the network's bridge contract, and there was a loss of $625 million in assets. So uh, this is definitely something to be aware of. And uh, just the last point on this, when different block blockchains interact, the security of the entire system is only as strong as its weakest link. So going back to the point that I, I mentioned at first, that that's really just uh, the point of the second camp where if you connect to another blockchain and it's weak, you be, you weaken yourself. So um, that's all I wanted to say about that. Let's go on to uh, the next slide. Um, I, I know I burned through all the interoperability stuff uh, really 
quickly. Um, and I want to give people a chance to take a look at that, to digest it. And while you're taking a look at that, I wanted to shift to uh, our September uh, presentation. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Pavan Argwal, the CEO of SunWest Mortgage, he is actually going to be our speaker for the September um, mortgage subgroup. He's going to talk about their solution. Um, I, I've spoken with Pavan several times. The, he is a dynamic speaker. I, I'm really impressed by him. Uh, so I, I highly encourage you guys to, to join that session and, and listen to um, what he has to say and take a look at his solution. I, I think you guys would be very impressed. Um, I, I'm probably falling into the category of fanboy of, of Pavan, but uh, he, he's a really good guy and I like him as well. Um, but I also wanted to share with you, so you saw our, the invitation for our old format, I mentioned earlier we wanted to share the new um, Hyperledger um, uh, logo and color schema. This is what that invitation would look like, and this is what we're going to be sending out within the next day or so, uh, announcing Pavan's participation in September. So uh, they went from circles to, uh, is that a hexagon, pentagon? I think it's a hexagon, uh, but I, I really like the, their new look. Okay, um, one of the things that I, I did want to mention, I, I know that uh, I think today is, is just a short uh, amount of topics, is we are going to be sending out a survey uh, to get information on future topics. One of the questions that we're considering uh, sending out is, do we do more sessions on AI and blockchain? Uh, or do we do a summary and move on to other topics? Are you guys interested in more technical information? I know uh, about a year or so ago, we did a couple of those where we showed you some of the POCs that we did, some of the errors that we experienced. So if you guys do have feedback on that, we can include that in our survey. If there are specific questions that you guys would like us to include, by all means. So we'll be sending that survey out within the next week or so, we'll have the survey out for probably a month just to get as much input because we, we do want this to, uh, to be as educational as possible and to uh, address the needs and requirements of the community. Um, let me pause there. James, was there anything you wanted to add to the, the survey or any other topics? You know, you know, as Marvin mentioned earlier, these sessions are really all about education. Um, it's about us finding information to share with the community to expand out. So it, honestly, this is really all about the community and what are they most interested in learning about. So definitely looking forward to us getting the survey out and gathering up results to see how we can be fine tuning these sessions, Marvin. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Um, also, if there are specific products that you guys would like to see, uh, as I mentioned, Pavan is going to go through his product. It's called Angel AI. Um, if we can get someone from Figure out here, I, I'd love for them to, to demo their products since, uh, as I mentioned, they are one of the larger players in the blockchain mortgage industry market. And there are other solutions out there. Um, I, I, several people have reached out to me saying, hey, we want to talk about this uh, product. So uh, we'll have some of those teed up uh, for the latter portion of the year and for 2024. Hey, uh, Marvin, Mark was asking in the chat too. Um, it looks like September 8th is actually a Friday. It might be the 14th, which is the second Thursday in September, which is when we normally do the presentation? You know what? You are right. It, it is September 14th. My yeah. apologies uh, for that date mix up. We're going to redo that and make sure we put in the right date before we send out the announcement. Great catch, Mark. Um, and now I, I, I need to reach out to Pavan and make sure I send him September 14th. I and not have him show up on, on the night. So um, any other questions or comments? I, I think this has just been a, a short presentation 
for this month, uh, but definitely open to any other suggestions or comments. Okay, hey guys, uh, I, if there are no other comments, I uh, definitely want to thank you guys for participating. Um, interoperability is a very thick topic, and I know I burned through that pretty quickly. So if you guys have questions or comments on that, let me know. Reach out to me directly or, or reach out to us uh, through uh, the Hyperledger. And this recording will become available on our wiki within the next day or so. Hey, everyone. Thank you very much. Have a great day.